Welcome to our first talk of this semester, the Quantitative Finance Seminar Series here at the Fields Institute. And uh, before introducing our speaker, I'd just like to thank our sponsors, Waterfront International, for their continual support of the seminar series, as well as Scotiabank for their continual support uh, of the fields through the Center for Financial Industries. So uh, next I'll introduce our speaker. So uh, Ren Wanju is currently a wise Gab Gabilan yeah. assistant professor in the Epstein Department of Industrial and Systems Engineering at the University of Southern California. Before joining USC, she spent two years as a Hook Research Fellow in the Mathematical Institute at the University of Oxford. <coughs> and she completed her PhD in the IEOR uh, department at UC Berkeley. Renu's research interests lie broadly in the span of stochastic analysis, mathematical finance, game theory, and machine learning. And uh, Renu re received the SIAM FME Early Career Prize in 2023 and a JP Morgan AI Research Award in 2022. Thank you, Ren Wan, for taking the time to come visit us. And we are going to hear all about learning to simulate tail risk scenarios. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Seb, for the very kind introduction and for inviting me here. And thanks, everyone, for uh, joining my seminar today in person or online. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about how to use machine learning methods to simulate uh, tail risk scenarios. Uh, this is based on joint work with Rama, Mihai, and Chao from Oxford. Uh, we posted the first version online last year, and we had some new results during the past two months. So this would be my first time sharing those uh, new results with everyone. Okay, let me get started. So I'll first talk about the motivation and the introduction of the framework, then talk about how we use score functions for risk measures to do the uh, to design the learning process, and then we will talk about the design and the theoretical guarantee of our uh, generative models, and then at the end I'll show some uh, numerical performance of the framework. Okay. So first I'll start with what is a market simulator? Suppose we have a distribution over the data, which is a joint distribution of the price dynamics over a given time period or some financial scenarios that we want to simulate. And the goal is to construct a probability distribution with some models based on the samples we could collect from the real world scenario. So we want our constructed probability distribution to be similar to the true underlying model under certain criteria. So that, that's the goal of constructing a market simulator. And why are we interested in constructing a market simulator? First of all, because um, when we want to have a better understanding of certain trading strategies or do a better back testing, uh, do a uh, do a better job in the back testing strategies we want to have in order to improve the risk management we want to have more scenarios okay. no worries <laughs> The idea is that we want to construct a joint distribution P model, given that we could access uh, N different samples uh, from the real world um, market. And one motivation is that when we want to uh, when we want to do back testing on our strategies and uh, try to improve the risk management part, we want to have more realistic market scenarios to test our strategies. Another motivation is many machine learning algorithms require a lot of data to make it work. And if we think markets are non-stationary and we only have very limited recent data to uh, train a machine learning algorithm, sometimes it's better to have a market simulator so that we could simulate more scenarios from those uh, simulator. And sometimes because the lack of public available data and it's quite sensitive to, to share data with collaborators, if we have a simulator, we can use that to do the collaboration. That's another uh, reason which is more from an academic perspective. So these are some motivations uh, motivate us to consider um, methods to do a uh, to construct a market realistic market simulator so um, before moving to the uh, data driven uh, um, era uh, in, in, in uh, so for classical models there are a few uh, traditional methods that we use a lot to do 
on market simulators, the first formulation is a parametric approach. So we use time series models such as Garch and ARIMA model, like diffusion models or jump processes. So those are like uh, stochastic processes we use to formulate the underlying price scenarios. And the benefit of using the, these models is that these models, some of these models are very successful uh, in low dimensional uh, applications involving a small number of homogeneous assets. But, what it, but it's very difficult to model the joint dynamics of assets within different asset classes. And if we have heterogeneous portfolio, it's very difficult to formulate the joint dynamics. And also it's sometimes quite challenging to, to scale that up to a high dimensional portfolio. And in that case, we may suffer from the risk of model misspecification by using those uh, parametric models. And Gaussian models uh, with constant coefficients are simple models, and we have we, we use this a lot. This 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 kind of model is easy to scale up in high dimensions, but again, they only work for homogeneous um, assets. And there are empirical studies showing that there would be some mismatch compared to the stellar facts we observe from the real financial markets. So that's one limitation of this. Um, Gaussian models with constant coefficients. Then we would like to move forward to this deep learning based uh, generative models to help us generate financial scenarios. First of all, these deep learning based methods are non parametric generative models. It doesn't require any prior knowledge on the shape of the distribution, and it's capable of handling complex and high dimensional data. We've seen that in the past. Uh, 10 years, there are many successes uh, in applications such as image generation, audio generation, and text generation. And we have observed a lot of studies showing that uh, this kind of non-parametric models are capable of generating diverse data sets, even to some extent to the data that we've never seen in the literature. But under certain scenarios, they are very similar to uh, real-world scenarios. Um, and uh, if we want to apply these, this deep learning based model to generate financial data, a key challenge is that we, knew, we need a new evaluation metric. For example, if we want to generate an image of a dog, we can use our eye to evaluate whether this image uh, has a dog or not. So that's a, a very good criteria to distinguish. <laughs> I try. I just building needing control, right? There. Okay. So, okay. Um, but sometimes when we want to generate time series, it's quite challenging to evaluate whether the time series is realistic or not. So we need to be very careful with the evaluation metric we choose. And um, so in the classic GAN literatures, most of the evaluation metric focus on global properties of the entire distribution instead of some problem dependent statistics. What we are going to show today is that uh, if we really care about the tail risk of uh, financial scenarios, sometimes we can focus on some problem dependent statistics in order uh, uh, rather than the uh, global properties such as KL divergence or YSS 10 distance. So that's one of the motivation, and I'll come back to this point later. I think this. Oh, it's not working. I might yeah. have to get Brian. Hold on. Let's try this. Yeah. Okay. Go backwards just to make sure. And forward. Okay. Awesome. Uh, so, so this is the, uh, uh, the, the very original uh, form, uh, framework for the generative adversarial neural networks uh, that uh, Goodfellow and his co-authors developed to generate images. So um, they, they designed this generative model uh, using unsupervised machine learning technique to build a minimax game between two players. So we have two neural networks in this game in order to generate uh, data, we have a discriminator and a generator. On a high-level perspective, 
player G, which is the generator uh, who is generating uh, fake samples, is trying to fool the player D by producing very natural looking data from some random latent vector Z. Oh, okay. Who's this one? And for the discriminator, the discriminator is like a teacher who could tell us whether this data is from the real data sets or from the generated data sets. So the discriminator is trying to distinguish between the real data and the generated data. So they have their different purposes in the network. We hope that by designing some minimax game, and if we reach some equilibrium, then the generator is able to generate some very uh, natural looking data and the discriminator is not able to distinguish between the real data and the generated data. So that's the idea from the original paper uh, proposed by Goodfellow. And if we put this minimax game into Oh, so this is uh, this is an example, uh, the first success of this generative adder of zero network. So on the left hand side, these are two pictures of dogs. And on the right hand side, those are the generated um, pictures of dogs. So we can clearly see that there are many natural looking dogs on the right hand side. So that's a successful, successful application. And oh. Okay, so if we put everything together mathematically, this would be the objective function uh, for the generator and the discriminator. Uh, so we can see that this one here, this would be the uh, loss function or objective function for player D. So what this player D is trying to do is that he wants to evaluate the data and provide a score. And if he thinks this data is from the true data set, then he wants to give a score which is close to one. One means it's a true true data. Uh, it's a data from true data set. And if the data is from the uh, generative model, then the discriminator is trying to provide a score which is close to zero. So he wants to maximize the log one minus d applied to the generated data. So the player D wants to maximize this loss function so that he wants to distinguish the true data uh, from the generated data. And on the other hand, our, what our dis generator is trying to do is that the generator tries to minimize this second part in this joint loss function so that the data generated by the generator should look super close to the true data. So this is the minimax game uh, that the, these two players are trying to play against each other. What we hope is that if player G and player D reaches equilibrium according to this loss function, then we should be able to have a decent generating model to help us generate data. Okay, so that's the key idea. Mm, and uh, in the past, three or four years, these generative models have been applied to build market simulators uh, in finance. So these are some uh, very nice papers. And most of these papers uh, use either cross entropy or was has 10 distance as a metric to guide the training process. And these are some like summary, oops. Should I? This one, do you, okay, sorry about that. So these are some uh, very nice references. So we can see that most of the references that focus on either KL divergence or uh, WASS time measures uh, as the criteria to design the training. And one key question I want to um, bring today is that uh, what is a proper evaluation metric we should use to guide the entire training uh, procedure? Because as we mentioned, if the generator generates a doc, it's easy for us to identify the quality of the generator by just looking at it. But if I provide you with several uh, time series models, can you tell me which path is a possible realization of SP500? It's very difficult to do that by eye. Therefore, we need more careful design in terms of the evaluation metric when we generate, 
when we construct market generators using uh, neural networks. And uh, as we mentioned, prior works focus mainly on the global property of the entire return distribution over a time period. What we want to emphasize today is that should we focus more on the global property or should we focus more on the uh, tail behavior? For example, if we want to, if we want to do backtesting and understand how risky our uh, trading strategies are, maybe we should focus more on the rare events. We want to simulate more rare events so that we have a good understanding about the risk of our strategies. Another motivation is that um, we know that some of the dynamic trading strategies we considered um, in, in, in practice are not linear mappings applied to the uh, to the return uh, asset returns. So there are nonlinear dynamics which are possibly not Lipschitz. So should we just focus on the distribution of the returns or should we look at the um, returns of dynamic trading strategies? Should we add some nonlinearity to have a better understanding of these strategies or not? So those are the uh, questions we considered uh, in, in the framework. Okay. Uh, and I'll provide one more example or mo uh, example to motivate our framework. Uh, so this is a definition for the push forward measure. So if we want to move a measure uh, uh, move a measure from one space to another space, we just apply a uh, measurable mapping. So if we, if we think about mu as the return of the distribution, we can view this F function as some strategies, then it gives us the distribution of the return of the strategy. So this is one example. Suppose mu and nu are two distributions of asset returns, and we denote pi as a strategy with asset returns as the input and final PNL as the output. And if we have a risk measure rho, which is holder continuous in the sense that uh, the risk measure applied to the final PNL has this uh, Lipschitz property with a constant L and some exponent kappa between zero and one. So this is a uh, holder continuous risk measures. And if in addition, we assume that pi is L Lipschitz, so our strategy is, pi, uh, is L Lipschitz, then we have this property here. So the difference between the risk measure of the PNLs of the strategies can be upper bounded by the L1 WASAS distance between these two return distributions. However, if those two Lipschitz co uh, coefficients are huge and this copper term is very small, then we know that even W1, the WASAS to one distance between these two return distributions are small. It's, it's not easy to guarantee that the, the right hand side would be small. So that's one of the motivations that instead of looking at the WASAS to distance, we want to have something that is more sensitive to the tail risk or to the risk measure. So that's the motivation. So on a high level, what we did in this uh, Telgan design is that we use value at risk, expected shortfall, and other two risk measures uh, as the guideline to, 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 to uh, as a guideline in the loss function to design the training process. And VAR and ES of a group of trading strategies are incorporated in the loss function through the notion of elicitability. So we use this elicitability property to help us design the loss function. Okay. Another thing is when we design the discriminator in order to distinguish the true data and the generated data, we use dynamic trading strategies to have some nonlinear cuts in the high dimensions in order to separate these two data sets and try to give a better performance in terms of distinguishing uh, these two distributions. So this is the high level overview of our design. Okay? Before talking about the uh, actual design, I want to spend a few minutes on the score functions for uh, risk measures. I know many audience here are expertise, but just bear me with uh, a few minutes on this. So this is a definition of the value at risk and the expected shortfall. Suppose we have a one dimensional distribution mu uh, with a finite mean and, a, and we want to specify a confidence level. Say for example, I, I care about the, the worst 10% of the distribution. Then we specify alpha as 10%. Then this far value would be the smallest number x on the real line so that the measure of x smaller than x 
is right above this alpha line. So this would be this point here uh, would be our value at risk. And if we integrate all the value at risk values from zero to alpha, then this would give us a expected shortfall. So value at risk is just this number for a particular quantile alpha and expected shortfall is more sensitive to the tail distribution because it integrates the entire uh, 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 tail. Okay. So this is the definition. And uh, uh, we want to utilize some properties called elicibility. And uh, this is a very nice definition. Uh, this is a definition which has very nice property. So a statistical function t is elicitable for a set of distributions if this statistics is the minimizer of some score function. So we can, so a few examples, and a score function S is called strict consistent for T if the minimizer is basically unique. So this gives us a very nice optimization problem. And these are a few examples. So if we have a, oh, I think I keep pressing the wrong button. Sorry about that. So these are some examples. If we look at the L2 difference between X and Y, the mean of a random variable would be a minimizer of this score function. And if we look at the L1 distance, then the medium would be a minimizer. So this is a very nice property because if we want to estimate these statistical functions from a distribution, for example, we want to estimate mean, we want to estimate medium, we want to estimate quantile. This nice property can help us to translate a statistical estimation problem to an optimization problem. So that can, and we know that there are many machine learning algorithms could help us to solve an optimization problem. And this notion could help us to bridge the techniques in these two domains, statistical learning and optimization. Okay, so that's a very nice property that we want to focus on two risks uh, classes that have these nice uh, properties. And Fisper and uh, his co-authors has showed that, so the, the expected shortfall itself is not elicitable, but var value and ES value are jointly elicitable if you put them together. And if we put them together, we can show that var and ES pair is elicitable if we define a score function like this. So we have several choices of the H1 function and H2 function. As long as they satisfy some conditions, we can show that this pair is the minimizer of the expected score function if we take X from this mu distribution. And uh, in this paper, so these are two famous quants on the street, and uh, they showed that they have a different choices compared to this uh, very uh, to the seminal paper, if you choose H1 and H2 functions like this, uh, it's still elicitable with respect to these two choices. And we showed in the experiment that this particular choice has better optimization landscape and it's easy to, to train in practice. So these are some observations in practice. Okay. And I think I'll skip that part. This part also shows that if we specify a class of spectral risk measures, and it's also elicitable. So it's a, a more general notion compared to VAR and ES, but I'll, I'll skip this part due to the um, time constraint. And now um, I'll, 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 I'll pause here to see if there are any questions before I continue to talk about the design and theoretical guarantee uh, for our TailGAN framework. The halfway point questions? Yeah. Is the percentile on its own elicitable? The value at risk? Yes. Yeah, value at risk itself is elicitable, but ES is not. Okay. okay. So, uh, so, so as we mentioned in the GAN uh, generative adversarial network design, we need two neural networks. One is the discriminator and the other one is the generator. So I'll start with the uh, design of the uh, discriminator in our framework. So in our setting, uh, we can design user specific generative models. So we can have a user who may be a portfolio manager and he's interested in 
a particular class of uh, strategies. So he can specify a set of benchmark trading strategies that may be static or dynamic. And we denote this pi k as the kth strategy in this benchmark set. And so this pi k takes the price and narrow as the input and the final PL as the output. And we denote this push forward measure pi k applied to PR as the distribution of the final PL for this strategy. Okay. So what we want for our discriminator is that theoretically, if we could input a strategy PL distribution, we want our discriminator to output two values, which are the correct var and es values so we basically want our discriminator to tell us the var and es value of the input distribution so that's the that's what the discriminator is trying to do provide the true um, tail risk measures okay? so mathematically this would be the formulation so this is the strategy pnl distribution we input this uh, into the uh, discriminator, and if a discriminator can do the job, then it will provide uh, provide the correct values. And we know that the true value, because of the elastability property, the true var and es value should be the minimizer of this function, right? Because of the elastability, then we know the true var and es value should be the minimizer. So we try to find a discriminator d so that this score function could be minimized so that's the that's what we want to do but in practice we won't be in practice we won't be able to input the entire distribution because we only have access to limited number of sample points so we won't be able to know the true distribution otherwise we don't want to we won't need to construct a simulator so what we could do is that every in every iteration we can only input n pnl samples from the real world scenarios so every time we input a few samples and we want to use those samples to train a discriminator so that it could still provide us with some decent estimates of the var and es value of the given input data sets so that's the idea so we know that if we input the uh, input and in different samples it's approximately an empirical distribution if we fix the sample size right and we know that if we could sort those input data and provide a ranked PNL, then it might be easier for the discriminator to tell us the var value and es value because if we have ranked PNL, then we have the uh, cdf right uh, so that's the idea so so in the design of the discriminator in practice we we, we have a neural sorting step to rank the pnl so that we hope this could help the discriminator to learn faster what is the var and es values then at this point you may wonder if the goal for the discriminator is just to provide some estimation of the var and es value then why don't we do a supervised learning we just estimate the var value and es value from the uh, data sets instead of using new network to generate something and the reason is that um, if we use if we replace the discriminator by the empirical var and es values it doesn't work well when the batch size n is small because if we have a heavy tail distributions it often requires thousands of samples to provide a decent estimate for the ES because you need to integrate the entire tail distribution so that requires a lot of samples to get a good estimate and uh, another reason is that if you start the discriminator with a very intelligent estimate then in that case generator you really doesn't learn anything so you want the discriminator and the generator to be at similar intelligence level through the entire training process otherwise the generator doesn't learn so that's a typical issue people encountered a lot in the training of generative models you want them to converge at a similar speed otherwise one of them will fail you converge to some local points so that's very important in practice 
And what we could observe later on in the numerical part is that if we keep the discriminator, it will have a better generalization property. So you generalize to unseen data sets compared to supervised learning. So we, we, we have a mathematical definition for generalization power, and then we compare that with supervised learning. So this is a few explanations on why we still want to keep a discriminator instead of using empirical measures to provide those two numbers. And then we move on to talk about the generator. So what the generator wants to do is that we want to take an input noise from the latent space, and then we want to use this new network to serve as a nonlinear mapping. And we hope that the output of this new network could provide us with some realistic financial scenarios. So that's the idea. And the key step is um, whether this generator is able to generate those samples or not. Okay. So, so in this, in this neural network, we parameterize the neural network with L layer fully connected neural network. And this sigma is some uh, nonlinear operators, but in practice, you can also add other tricks to make it uh, more complex. And uh, so I, then I want to talk about what is the objective function for the generator. So what's the loss function we want to guide the training uh, for the generator? Uh, remember that um, the elicibility property tells us that the var and ES value of the final PNL should be the minimizer of this objective function. So that's because of the elicibility. So what the generator is trying to do is that it wants to best match the two risks across the benchmark strategies we designed here. So suppose we are given a discriminator that tells us out, uh, that tells us two values, the VAR and ES prediction from a given discriminator. What the generator is trying to do is that the generator wants to generate data so that the score function is minimized. So it matches the till risks okay, evaluated from discriminator. So the generator is doing this optimization problem and try to find the, try to match the till risks of this particular distribution here. So this is the true distribution, and we want to find a generator so that these two numbers could match the var and ES of the true data sets. So that's the idea. So it's through this elicitability property, the design of the objective function for G. Okay. And what we could, is, so this is, uh, so what we could show is that if the objective function for the generator is designed like this, and we specify the generator as a fully connected neural network, then under these uh, very mild assumptions, for example, the Lipschitz continuity of the strategies and our noise distributions and targeted distributions have some regularity properties. If under these conditions, we can show a universal approximation theorem for the generator. So assume the above assumptions holds, then we specify a tolerance of the error, epsilon. In that, if we specify this epsilon, then there exists a positive integer n1, which is on the order of one over epsilon, uh, one over epsilon square, and a fully connected neural network G1 can give us this very nice property. Okay, so the gradient of this neural network G1 apply to the latent uh, and the, the distribution of the noise can provide us with a distribution so that the var of this distribution is epsilon close to the var of the true distribution. So this is the universal approximation property. So we can see that the width and the 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 the, the width and the depth of the of the neural network is uh, proportional, log proportional, and a power proportional to, to, to this epsilon key. So it, in, in theory, the network should be sufficiently deep and sufficiently wide in order to match the tail risk we want. So this is the theoretical result. And we can see that for the expected shortfall, uh, it's uh, the condition, so the neural network is slightly, it's bigger. So recall that this, beta 
uh, is the condition on the true distribution. So the true distribution needs to have a bounded beta movement between beta is between one and two, and if it's bigger than two, we can just use this number two to have a bounded beta movement. And this beta appears here because the movement uh, decides the tail behavior to some extent. So we need uh, N2 to be on this order in order to provide a distribution that matches the expected shortfall. So that's the result. And we could get similar results for uh, risk measures that are holder continuous under one system measure. So these are some results. And the proof of this universal approximation uh, has two steps. The first step, we approximate the target distribution PR by an empirical measure with n samples. And the next step is to construct a semi-discrete optimal transport. So we want to transport a distribution, for example, uniform distribution to this uh, empirical measure. So it's a semi-discrete optimal transport. And we can see that this transport mapping is a gradient of a potential phi. And the nice thing about our framework is that this potential phi has an explicit structure. So this phi is the maximum of finite number of affine functions. And we know that a finite number of affine functions can be represented by a neural network. So that's how we connected this approximation theorem. And another thing you may notice is that, so in, in the define of this push forward measure, it's the gradient of the a neural network, it's not a neural network itself. Uh, the reason why we have this is that gradient of a neural network naturally represents disjoint functions, okay? and which is critical in, uh, in our framework because we want to map from a single connected set to disconnected supports because we have empirical measure. So that's why we have this gradient of the neural network to do this. Now, finally, we will arrive at uh, the objective function here. As I mentioned, we, we kind of discussed the, the objective functions for the discriminator and the generator separately. So what we want to do is that if we have access to the uh, true distribution, we want our discriminator to output the correct var and es value of the true distribution. Right? And then once we have a perfect uh, discriminator, we want to use this perfect discriminator to guide the training of the generator. Right? So these are a bi-level optimization problem. This is for the discriminator. And once we have the discriminator, and we can design that for, for the generator. But this, is, this bi-level optimization problem is not very easy to train because we can't do this like for multiple times and then we go back to the generator. This doesn't work in practice. What we could show is that under very mild conditions on uh, um, reachability, like uh, achievability for the minimizer and maximizers, we could show that the bi-level optimization problem is equivalent to this minimax game. So once we have this minimax game, it's closer to what people have studied in the traditional GAN literature. So you have a minimax game, you have a single uh, objective function. So we can show that uh, th those, the, the bi-level optimization problem in six and seven is equivalent to this minimax game for any like, launch multiplayer lambda bigger than zero. And the proof of this equivalent formulation uh, relies on the elicitability property of the join of the var and es value as well as the consistency property for the score function. So these are the uh, properties we use to show the equivalence. Then what, uh, we are ready to use a sample-based version um, to, to, to guide the training because in this formulation, it's still a theoretical formulation, we won't be able to input the true distribution. We need to approximate that. So everything here in the expectation when we want to do that in practice, we need to approximate this with empirical measures. So this would be a sample-based approximation that we could actually implement in practice when we train uh, the generator and the discriminator. So it's just a sample-based approximation to what we have before. So this would be the uh, loss function we use in practice to, to train the generator. Okay. okay, and in summary, this would be the entire 
architecture. So for the generator, we input a noise to, the, to one neural network and it gives us simulated scenarios. And we can also access uh, price scenarios from practice. And so these two different price scenarios would be the input to the discriminator. So the discriminator wants to distinguish and we have another layer of neural salting to help the discriminator to provide a, a more efficient estimation and then the discriminator will give us a score and then we go back to the to, to iteratively update the generator and the discriminator. One uh, final comment I have in terms of the architecture design is that our discriminator is explainable because we would expect what the discriminator provides us would be the var and es value of the input distribution. This is different from most of the other GAN frameworks, so it's purely black box. You won't be able to know what the discriminator is, is trying to do there, but we have this explainability property and you can separate this discriminator to do some testing to see the performance. So that's another uh, benefit from, from the uh, design. So I'll see if there are other questions for the design and the theoretical part before I show some numerical performance. So, yeah, I think I have enough time to share some numerical performance. Um, so we train our GAN, uh, tail GAN framework on uh, several different strategies. The first one is static trading strategy. So we just buy and hold some portfolio, some assets. Uh, and, uh, and for dynamic trading strategies, we consider some pretty popular ones, mean reverting strategy and trend follow, following strategy on some portfolio linear combination of assets. And we compare our Telgan architecture with three, uh, we have four benchmark models. So the first one is we just use, uh, we just train GAN with a static strategy. So it's like buy and hold strategies. And then, uh, and then we train our Telgan uh, uh, Tilgan with static multi-asset portfolios. Okay, so th the first one would be single asset and the second one is multi-asset. And we also compare the Tilgan framework with the historical simulation method. So we just use historical var and ES value to predict the value for the next time period. This is a useful benchmark to see whether we have stationarity in our data or not, because most of the GAN architectures assume that you have some uh, stationarity uh, in some sense. And also we compare our performance with the WASA Tangan, which focus on the global property of the entire distribution. So these are some, um, these are some benchmarks we compared. So this is a, a zoom in on the tail behavior. So we, we, we applied our framework to both the simulated data and real world data. So this is a testing on real world data with 10 different assets. So you can see that we have Garsh model with T distribution with index of 10. So these are just, we can see uh, these are some, uh, these are some tail behaviors. So we can see that uh, so this, this blue one is the, the underlying true data. And we can see that in terms of capturing the tail risk of different strategies, we see that the red line here is it essentially covers the blue line here. So it's very consistent with uh, what we applied to the true underlying data set. Whereas if we see the static performance, we can see that at the centering of the distribution, it works fine. But if we go to the tails, you can see that it has a mismatch in the tails. Okay. If we if we don't include those dynamic strategies, and uh, and if we look at the learning uh, uh, in terms of temporal and correlation patterns, we can see that A is the true um, um, temporal pattern and uh, a correlation pattern and the temporal pattern in, in column A. And we can see that the, the tail gun captures uh, the, the most accurate patterns and behaviors from the uh, real world data set. And I think I have a final 
uh, performance measure in terms of matrices, and we also have the Wasa Stangan here on this table here, we can see that, so this SE1000 would be a simulation using the ground truth uh, with 1,000 uh, 1, samples, so this would serve as a benchmark. And the historical simulation method gave a similar number, that means at least for the data we input to the model, it's stationary, and we see that mm, our telcan has the smallest error compared to all these four methods, and the wasas can get the error is around 20 percent, but the error for our model is like 4.6 percent because it really captures better uh, the, 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 the risk of different uh, strategies. Uh, I think I have some more results to show. I probably have time to quickly go over this as well. And I mentioned that um, why we want to use um, discriminator, so on supervised learning method, compared to the supervised learning method where we just use uh, sample var and sample ES uh, values. Uh, the reason is because of this. We can see that you, if you train the model more and more with more iterations, the scan framework with a discriminator, the discriminator can memorize more information compared to just the input within this uh, inner iteration, within this single iteration. So through the time, it provides better performance compared to the scenario we just use the empirical values. And it gives us a better um, sampling out of sample errors. Uh, compare as well. Mm -hmm. I think I'll skip this part. And in order to make the algorithm um, more scalable in high dimensions, we also applied the Egan portfolio uh, to handle high dimensional cases. And we can see that it works pretty, uh, uh, pretty, pretty well. Another, exa another uh, experiment we did is that we use the on, on spectral risk as well. So we use the spectral risk with two different levels. So instead of only focusing on one level in training, we put uh, both 1% and 5% uh, in, in the design, and it also provides pretty decent uh, results on, on this case. Okay, I'll, I'll stop here. Thanks, everyone. Okay, we can open up the floor for questions, uh, both online and in person. Tom, I see you turn on your camera. Does that mean you have a question or comment? No, it was very clear. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay, Vedant. Hi, thank you for the talk. So my question is, when we are dealing with this scenario, we can work with a single value of alpha, or can we consider multiple values of alpha at the same time? Yeah, we can consider multiple uh, alphas. So we need to use the spectral risk measure to have multiple alphas, and we can also train that. Okay, because so like the we spectral can risk measures is, uh, if I go back to here, I think I have one slide here. Okay, it's here. So uh, spectral risk measures with a uh, uh, finance support uh, are jointly eliciable. So you can is specify a few levels. It's, so it's still eliciable, and you can put that into the loss function, and that could be trained together to put multiple levels. OK, and my second question is, in this method, we can be sure that like at least the tails of the distribution are matching. But can we say something about the central part of the distribution? Uh, okay, that's a very good question. If your strategy cares about the center distribution and you put your strategy into the training, then that would be sensitive to, to the center part of the distribution. And if your strategy, the loss of your strategy doesn't care about what happens in between, then the generated data won't be sens uh, sensitive to, to those parts. It really depends on uh, what you want to do with the model. Uh, yeah, thank you for the talk. Can you actually go to page 21? I think that will help with the formula just to see it in front. Oh, no, it's not 21. Can you go back <laughs> where you have the optimization problem? Uh, yeah, here. Lab. Okay. 
yeah, mm -hmm. 19. Okay, mm -hmm. I misremember that. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could, you know, when you were, when you, you said you have a sample input, right? Uh -huh. So you have some samples, uh -huh. and then you try to kind of predict the valid risk and expected shortfall of uh -huh. your, uh -huh. of your portfolio. Can uh -huh. you say something um, about how many sample points you uh -huh. need uh -huh. to actually predict a specific uh -huh. alpha uh -huh. level? Uh -huh. Because uh -huh. for example, if you just take uh -huh. two, 10, and uh -huh. you want to predict the 99th uh -huh. or 0 uh -huh. 0.01 um, uh -huh. valued risk, uh -huh. then that's not really right. doable. So uh -huh. is there a restriction on, uh -huh. on the sample points? That you that's need? a very good question. So if you want to estimate the yes value of the distribution, you may need a lot of sample points, right? But what the discriminator here is trying to do is that because we need to train this for multiple iterations, even when we only have 100 samples in each iteration, the discriminator will memorize the property of the data points in previous iterations. For example, we are at 100 iteration and we only input 100 data points. It will still give us a decent estimation when we train more and more the discriminator. That's the benefit of using a neural network to memorize what happened before compared to use uh, uh, sample uh, empirical measures every time. That's the benefit compared to supervised learning. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, so my question is, you're focusing in on VAR and expected shortfall yeah. and then the spectral risk measure as well. Mm -hmm. Did you notice any significant changes or did you do any testing if you mm -hmm. use different pairs of coherent risk measures? And then an additional mm -hmm. question is, does mm -hmm. the risk measure have to be coherent? Mm, yeah, so we, we, we uh, what we did in the experiment is that we used for an ES value, we used spectral risk measures with a few levels, like up to three levels. That's what we did in the experiment uh, because we really need this elicitability. And uh, yeah. Uh -huh. So essentially what we need is that we, we really need the uh, stat uh, statistic function we use here is the minimizer of something that we could optimize. So that's the key property we use. And for consistency, we want that because that will give us a unique solution. So that makes the whole training process easier. So although this may be a restrictive uh, class of risk measures, but it's easier to, to work with in, in practice when you train neural network based methods. Uh, maybe two questions. One, one maybe is naive. So I saw your, um, your statement for the universal approximation. So uh -huh. is there a reason, a particular reason why you have like, say, unbound, like a, you have arbitrary width and depth as opposed to like one where it's like bounded width and arbitrary depth or uh -huh. arbitrary depth and bounded uh -huh. width? Is there a uh -huh. reason why both of them are, uh -huh. are growing? Uh -huh. That's a very good question. I think that's a, a easy way to walk around, to be honest, because uh, essentially what we want to do here is that we realize that the, 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 the transport mapping is a gradient of some uh, potential function. And we want to match this uh, uh, maximum of many affine functions. Uh, in order to match that, we realize that it's easy to expand the, diamond, the, the width and the depth at the same time. I don't know whether you can just do it with letting one goes to uh, infinity or not even it's like taking bigger values, but it's easier to, to, to approximate this I see. function. Okay. Thank you. I think it's a follow-up question, maybe a little bit related to what oh. I think Sylvana was saying. I don't know if it was entirely, maybe it's, it's maybe too similar. Let's see. So, um, so suppose you're so you're fitting the tail, and it seems to be fitting the tail well. And uh -huh. so, say I have history where I have like, um, you know, some tail data and everything. But what if I am like, you know, I have some extreme event like COVID or something, like some really. Uh -huh fat-tailed uh -huh. behavior. So uh -huh. um, can you say something about like, uh -huh. is this good at matching the tail exponent, like say uh -huh. of how it decays generally, or is uh -huh. there like some kind of uh -huh. medium uh -huh. scale effect uh -huh. where like it'll uh -huh. capture some fat tail effects, but uh -huh. you know, up to some point. So it's uh -huh. good for some, uh -huh. you know, tail, tail risks, uh -huh. uh, but like maybe some like really deep uh -huh. out of the money type uh -huh. things, like you uh -huh. may have some uh -huh. uh, uncertainty there. Can you comment on that? It really depends on whether you view on COVID, the, the effect of COVID as a rare event to the economy in the entire history, 
or you view that as a shift of the, uh, the, 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 the environment. If it's a shift of the environment, then I think GAN framework will not be able to do that because we theoretically we need IAD input. But if you view that as a rare event, then it should be able to handle that. It really depends on how we view that in the history. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. And then we'll, maybe we'll wrap. And so could you move to the um, slide where you have some trading strategy? Have some. <laughs> The definition or the uh, figures. No, I mean, uh, for the training, uh, I think is the the last few slide. Oh, you mean the uh, plots? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where you mentioned some sort of a station. Uh -huh. uh, sta yeah. Yeah. So I was wondering, um, is it possible to try some other strategy in uh -huh. here? Uh -huh. uh, for example, for perhaps you can have a strategy that, um, depending on what your data is, uh -huh. uh, that try to arbitrage uh -huh. or do a statistical arbitrage and uh -huh. then fit into your uh -huh. mod, uh, fit into your uh, uh, gang and uh -huh. see, see uh -huh. what, what is going on there. Yeah, I, I think it's possible. It's uh, it, this is like a um, user specific architecture. You can include all the trading strategies you are interested in. It doesn't ha need to have a unified framework. You can just put the strategies you are interested in to the uh, training framework. So what the gang will do is that it will provide data for you to test those strategies you're interested in. So you can specify different strategies. Okay, I'm going to take the preview of asking a question. Uh -huh. So can, can you go back to where you had the minimax problem or even actually the slide before where it was two uh, consecutive? Yeah, maybe one. one okay, yeah. stop there. Mm -hmm. So one thing that puzzles me a little bit is uh -huh. that you call this D uh -huh. a discriminator yeah. when what it's doing is eliciting uh -huh. the value at risk uh -huh. and the expected uh -huh. shortfall, right? Right. Uh -huh. And so your discriminator actually just elicits value at risk and expected yes. shortfall. Yes. But then yes. what seems to go into your, uh -huh. uh, in, into this year, like look at equation seven, I uh -huh. guess, right? Uh -huh. There is this, you then evaluate the score uh -huh. of those elicited values. Uh -huh. And so I'm a little bit confused about if this S sub alpha uh -huh. there, uh -huh. What's its relationship to the to uh -huh. the score function uh -huh. for eliciting, say, expected shortfall? And, yeah, that's and the score function. For it is. Yeah, it's so, the score function. So, so what? Uh -huh. So essentially, this is the discriminator that tries yeah. to give us the true var and es value. Yes. So yeah, var and es value are like the uh, yeah, scores yeah. in the traditional GAN architecture. So it's, uh, I think the terminology is a bit confusing. This is a score yeah, function. Yeah, the score is, I mean, yeah. Yeah, this is just the awesome. score function, yeah. but this is like providing score zero or one. So zero would be the true, uh, uh, fake picture. One is the true picture in the uh, classic setting. So here is that if um, it also depends on the landscape no, of the score function. The, the argument of D there, uh -huh. is, it, is it not? Um, uh -huh. Okay, if there was only one, uh -huh. K, I guess K is the different uh, strategies. Strategies, yes. Right. Uh -huh. So let's just say there's only one strategy. Right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Then the argument is supposed to be the, the expected shortfall of that game and uh -huh. the value uh -huh. at risk of that game, right? Yeah. The yeah. argument there. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So how, how does that translate to zero or one? I, I don't, uh -huh. that's, uh -huh. that's what I don't see. Ah, I see. Right? So, so for, for the discriminator, if the input distribution uh, the input uh, so for the input distribution, if you think it's the true distribution, then what the discriminator is trying to do is try to give the value that could minimize the score function. Yes. And if it's not, then you just choose some values that are further away so that the score function is not minimized. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. I think we're going to chat more over dinner. Yeah. So uh, why don't we thank uh, Renwan for the interesting talk, and uh, I'll see you next month. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.